Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. This is Joey Klein. You're listening to Tech Talk. Happy Friday morning, everyone. Okay, uh, as always, we've got three of the best uh, technology CEOs in Atlanta today for you to hear from. Uh, first, we're going to talk to Chris Carneal of Booster. Greetings. Thanks for letting me be here. Absolutely, Chris. Uh, then we're going to talk to Eric Bush of Demand Driven Technology. Good to be with you, Joey. And finally, we've got Scott Roby of Where to Go. Thanks, Joey. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. Okay, as always, we go alphabetical here, so we are going to start with Chris. Chris, how are we this morning? Joey, great. It's hot in Atlanta, but uh, the Braves are going to make the playoffs, so I'm excited. <laughs> Good. That, that's what's keeping you going today? That's right. Okay. Um, so you have made a very large business out of fun runs. That's right. Okay. Started 17 and a half years ago. We've run about 15,000 of them since. Uh, we've raised schools a profit of about $300 million, and we feel like we're just getting started. So you started this business in college? College dorm room, Sanford University in 2002. Okay. So we hear, we hear a lot of romanticism, at least when, you know, looked at from hindsight, you know, being 2020 about the college dorm room entrepreneur. Uh, can, g- g- give us the real deal. The real deal, it was not romantic. Uh, I had enough uh, inventory. I had to move out of my room and sleep on the floor uh, because that was a storage closet. No money, no business experience. Uh, a dream, a hope, one client who I called yesterday at the beginning of the school year. I call him every, uh, April 15th and every August 15th and express gratitude for being the first client. Any entrepreneur knows that without the first client, we probably wouldn't be here. So called Bill and thanked him again and told him we'll have about a thousand employees, uh, in October and we'll work with about 3,600 schools. And it all started with him and a uh, opportunity in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, when you say inventory, what do you mean? So what we do is primarily booster is probably most known for our school fundraising program, the Boosterthon Fun Run, where instead of selling products, which was the norm two decades ago, students run laps around a track that we set up with music and speakers and inflatables and tunnels, just a fun experience. And in the two weeks leading up to that, they're getting pledges for the number of laps they run. When they get pledges, they're also rewarded with some fitness rewards. So it's evolved into a a pretty large organization and operation now. But at the time, I was giving out frisbees and basketballs and footballs if the students earned pledges for their fun run. So I I think anyone listening to this, whether you think of your time as a former student or as a parent now, you probably have been to one of these, right? You know, you've had your kid who, you know, goes and pledges a number of laps and, uh, you know, family members will... Uh, go and you know pledge a certain amount of money. So that's our experience with this. Why did you feel that it was necessary for there to be a professional organization to take over this function? That's a uh, that's a great uh, question that makes sense in my mind today. None of that went through my head as a uh, as a twenty one year old in college. Certainly not professional or organization. Uh, my mom was a teacher. I'm the child of a lifelong educator. She taught for thirty five years. So grew, growing up in a Educators home, knowing the need for funds and knowing how much, uh, work teachers do. And the, if I could take a little bit of the work off the educator's plate, they could focus on, uh, education. So how could I raise more money, create a fun experience, take work off the educator's plate? Uh, and it's, it's grown from there, but I really just saw a need and I thought there's got to be a better way to do this. So when Booster goes and convinces, you know, uh, XYZ elementary school to essentially outsource that function of fundraising to Booster, are, are you going to parents? Are you going to the corporate community? How are you going and, uh, doing it quickly and increasing the amount of funds raised? Yeah. Great question. Uh, we usually start with the parent organization of sorts, PTA, PTO, Booster Club. Sometimes it's through the administration. Uh, the principal wants to raise funds for a new gym floor or for, uh, the PE department for teachers continued education or maybe to bring a PE coach that's part time, full time. So it goes to incredible, uh, sources. We approach schools really one at a time. At, at this point now, and once we've us- usually served a school or two in a county, the word spreads, good or bad. If we do a great job, it'll spread. If we drop the ball, everybody talks. So word of mouth has been our primary uh, source uh, from 17 years till to now. So 
do an excellent job, serve the client, go above and beyond, and ask them permission to uh, to reach out to other schools. Do, do you have any metrics on on average how much you know? Let, let's let's take average uh, you know fundraiser, not sure. by professional organization. What you guys are able to get on a multiple of that? Yes, um, a school that hosts a school that does fundraising on their own. That's a big, broad brushstroke. So you can, they can sell cookies, which usually they're using some organization. They can do car washes. They can ask for funds or direct give. Uh, but typically, schools hires, uh, hire us because we have a reputation for raising them at least twice as much as they can do with another organization or on their own. In addition to that, we're saving them a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So if you've ever been part of a, a uh, fundraiser of any sort, it takes a lot of time to organize and motivate and coordinate. And we think that the educator's time especially is more valuable spent educating. I can definitely see that. Um, so when you, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about the business model from the perspective of, let's say you have an elementary school in Metro Atlanta. Okay. Yep. What, what sort of repeat business comes? Is, is this a once a semester thing? Is this a once a year? How once does it a work? year is the most sustainable. Schools okay. might do multiple fundraisers throughout the year. We like to be their one major fundraiser in a semester. There's usually, if you're a parent that's listening, you're probably used to a fall and a spring fundraiser, at least in the elementary school space. Uh, we currently in Atlanta have a 92% retention rate of clients. So the average school we work with, um, not too far from here, is Soap Creek Elementary. Mm-hmm. And we've worked with them for, I think this is our 13th year kicking off next week. So our goal is to improve the program every year, raise them more, and go above and beyond, personalize it even more. I mean, what, what's interesting about this is that you – so, of course, this show is called Tech Talk. And granted, what we're talking about right now is very much a services and event company. We're going to get into the fact that there is a software component. Um but you're almost describing, um, you know, a recurring revenue model, right? That that so many tech companies look at. S- similar, but we're um, schools only sign a one year contract. And I see. We, we like it that way, and we say if we don't do a great job, you don't need to have us back. You know, commit to one year, see how it goes. So in a sense, it, it's not recurring revenue in the way that the audience would understand it. We have to work uh, hard at it every year to, to keep it. But uh, we do measure, and in fact, the center of our bullseye is client retention. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so now that we touched upon it a little bit, let's get into the software component of Booster. Sure. I'll give a background in my college dorm. Uh, and then for the first from 2002 to 2010, at least eight years, we used paper pledge books, meaning I would go to Kinko's, eventually a print company, and then eventually insource some of that. And students would get forms and they'd check a box and then we'd have to record it. Highly labor intensive, uh, completely manual. And this is, this is, I mean, I remember seven years ago, you know, my mom, I use an example, the educator would not dare enter her credit card online, right? Seven years ago. Now there's an Amazon package on her front door every single day. So the world's changed. Uh, we have to change with it. We defined ourselves as an event company, but we've realized in the past five or six years, we have to be a technology company uh, to a large degree. So funrun.com was built, proprietary, kind of ground up, learning as we go, insourcing and then outsourcing some some services to where all pledges are now made online. It's much easier to track, safer, secure, um, less labor intensive. So Okay. Um, and now, so you, you've touched on the fact that really – at least the way that I hear it, you are a services company, you're an event company, you're a bit of a technology company as well. So how, I mean, look, in, in the grand scheme of things, the company is still fairly young as far as, you know, corporate, uh, you know, years go, right? And so how do you maintain an identity, build a culture around a company that is so many different things? Well, culture is my number one focus as the founder CEO. Uh, we just had our training week, Booster University, last week, and the entire week, every single year, we bring all team members in from all over the country, and it's dedicated to culture. We want them to have what we call a DNA infusion of who we are. Then they go back to their respective cities. We serve schools in all 50 states. We have offices in uh, 46 different forty six different cities, um, and that's where they train and they learn what to do and how to do it, but the why they do it and who we are, we just really emphasize over the week of Boost University. So we talk about our company values that we've just changed to virtues. So our six virtues, who are we as an organization? Uh, I'm wearing a wristband of our six virtues right now. We um, we just go over the top and emphasizing who we are mm-hmm. that then flows into what we do. So we want all team members to 
understand the DNA and the culture of Booster and how we're distinctive. Is this internal event the primary means by which you spread culture from the Atlanta headquarters to the other offices? Yes, that coupled with the fact that our GM of each market is the cultural owner of that market. We're okay. not a franchise model. Uh, it, it's all it's all one organization, but we really trust the GMs to infuse the culture uh, into their team. So they take it and they own it and they run with it. Okay. Well, so certainly, all right. So you got GMs in each market that have um, a certain amount of autonomy there. Um, Atlanta is the mothership. How are you going about culture obviously depends heavily on recruiting. Okay. That's right. So how are you going about recruiting the best people um, to live this culture? And how do you know? Mm. I mean, how, or at least how can you be as sure as you can that they're going to be great fits? Yep. Well, let me just brag on my team for a second. I think we have the greatest team on the planet, about a 1,000 team members, 900 of which are millennials, uh, 600 of which are 25 or under, maybe 650. So um, they're, they want to change the world. That's our company purpose. Uh, and we feel like sometimes millennials get a bad rap. I think they are doing it. If you select the right millennial with the grit and the courage and the work ethic coupled with their idealism, I think it's just the, the greatest game-changing generation. Uh, my friends at Chick-fil-A have reworked our vocabulary that it's um, – we're not recruiting, we're selecting. So we want to create a great environment where there's a talent pipeline and we want to select the best that fit the virtues and culture of our organization. We can teach a lot of the skill sets, not the web programming. And I mean, our, there's a lot of functions of the business that are require uh, team members with lots of experience. But mm -hmm. the vast majority of the event team members, uh, if they fit our ideals, our virtues, they're passionate about serving others. Care is one of our virtues. So we just ask questions around our virtues. When was the last time you went above and beyond and cared for people? What does it mean uh, to display courage and grit? How do you like to celebrate other people? So we just walk them through who we are, listen to their responses, uh, and it's pretty apparent quickly who feels like a fit. It's th those meetings at Starbucks or at our office are uh, polarizing in a good way. They're either instantly attracted to the organization or they say, this is just not for me. Yeah. Well, and it's good to get that out of the way, yeah. um, whether, whether it is you selecting or them self-selecting themselves out. Yep, that's right. Well, as a millennial on the older side of the age spectrum, I very much appreciate the uh, uh, the compliment there. Yeah, because <laughs> because yes, I think uh, I think the generation does get a little bit of a bad rap sometimes, but just as with every other generation on this planet, there is quite a range of personalities. That's right. We feel like we got the best. If anybody listening uh, wants to join the calls, change the world, and serve schools, choose booster com as our website. Love it. So you mentioned Chick-fil-A, and actually you and I were introduced by um, a Chick-fil-A connection. Yep. And so I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your connection with that organization. Oh, man. I uh, I think they're one of the greatest uh, companies on the planet for so many reasons. I have many, many friends uh, that work there. Um, I had the great opportunity, uh, one of the greatest opportunities in my life professionally about 10 years ago to host some of Dan Cathy's PR tours as he traveled the country. We were in the event business. We kind of collaborated on an event. So I got to go with him and then our team in each city would help him put on some events. So learning from him, Tim Tosopoulos, their president, Cliff Robinson, field operations. I mean, many of their teamers have mentored our team. They sell chicken. We run students in a circle. Uh, but culturally and values wise, uh, and the way in which we attempt to care for our clients, we, we try to rip as many pages out of their playbook as possible. Look, I, I vividly remember, you know, the first time that I actually went and ordered a Chick-fil-A myself, as opposed to a parent doing it for me. Um, and one, what was striking was the age of those behind the counter as young. And two, what was striking was the intense politeness mm -hmm. in just every single interaction. And I mean, any anyone who goes there, it strikes them immediately. They yep. really have differentiated themselves as a fast food organization. Yep. People want to work with people that care. And it's just obvious that Chick-fil-A and I hope Booster uh, clients feel like we care about them. So one thing I'm curious about, um, right now you're very focused on elementary schools. And when we talked, it sounded like the focus was really going to stay elementary schools. But I think to me and a lot of people listening to this probably think, my God, this could apply to corporates. This could apply to nonprofits. Yeah. The enthusiasm, the technology, uh, just the process for an event, right? It's applicable across so many industries. So I'm curious about your business decision to at least for now be – laser focused on elementary schools? Well, I have a very good executive team that reigns in me. I'm an ENFP, Myers-Briggs, seven Enneagram. <laughs> so I want to do all of it and more yesterday. 
Uh, I just know that that's not the best way to run a business. So the sequencing and organization and systematizing of the ideas uh, has to work in a process. And I'm not great at building processes, but I respect my team that does. So I and team come up with some good ideas and they sequence it. And we just, we trust each other to do so. Uh, there's 100,000 American elementary schools and we're working with 3,600. And while we're the largest fundraising company in America for schools, uh, we're at 3.6% of the market. Uh, so we feel like there's 25 thousand servable schools geographically demographically in our sweet spot size wise and so forth and then we want to figure out other ways to serve the other seventy five thousand, and that's just elementary we're currently piloting uh some middle school programs and then we'll eventually Mm -hmm. move to high school so we we want to change the world by changing communities and so much of life is is built around the local schools so if we can help fund them create um space and time for the teachers to educate uh, we think that's the greatest way we can make a difference okay so so let's dig down on that i because i'm a sales guy through and through and when i hear about uh you know twenty five thousand additional schools i want to know about how you get there yeah well we're we're figuring it out but this sounds overly simplistic but if you go above and beyond and create an emotional connection with a client where the program and process is remarkable literally they feel compelled to remark and talk about it to other people their colleagues that's the speed of trust that stephen covey talks about we're we're not credible to the new school that we've never served, but that fellow principal, the coworker is. So when he or she goes to a principal's meeting, they say, you're not going to believe what we just did. We just doubled our money. We raised 40000 instead of 20000 We didn't have to do the work. And the, these team members who are on our campus were amazing. The technology was simple. The parents loved it. It was over in a week and a half. That school contacts us, and we go. So we just we focus. We have an incredible marketing department. Uh, that's telling the story, but we just really focus on the quality of the program. So are you primarily getting inbound requests or do you have a team out there who's pounding the pavement and getting in front of these schools? Yes, it's both. It's both. And I think you're, you know, we're, we're top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, uh, pounding the pavements. It's, it's storytelling and, and mm-hmm. reaching out and inviting schools to a run at a, another school. Here's a school in your area. We want to make you aware. We're now in uh, this part of the con- country, the city, your county, come and observe. So, and usually a uh, administration will say, well, sure, there's a local school that wants to just watch it on our campus. That's if, if a school comes and watches our program in person and talks to the faculty and staff, 99% of the time they'll sign up. Yeah. Yeah. That, that proof of concept is better than anything said in a, you know, back and forth. Yep. Um, what, do, 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 does anyone have misconceptions about what it takes to put these things on? Oh yes. Um, and that's okay. We lose if if a school goes with booster and then maybe the next year doesn't. The primary reason is, uh, hey, we think we could do this on our own. We charge a percentage of what's raised, so mm-hmm. we've we've de-risked it for the school. And then the more they raise, the more they keep. So uh, we we have a model we feel like uh, is the the most fair uh, financially possible. But sometimes schools will say, can we save the percentage? And yes, you can, but more often than not, because you raise so far less, the pie shrinks. And when you do it on your own, you're paying a far greater percentage. It's very tough for school to do it for less than we charge as a percentage because we're spending money uh, to pour about 75% of what we raise is just going back on the campus to to mobilize uh, donors and students and faculty to raise more. Gotcha. How – so you said, okay, Soap Creek, you've worked with this school for 13 years. Okay. So – what are you doing to keep events fresh every year? Right, so, there's there's going to be some new participants, but there are going to be yep. some who've done this year after year. Great question. That's a great question. Uh, one, Soap Creek, I think this year is about to hit, or they do they just hit it a, a million dollars total school profit raised in our partnership with them over the past decade plus. Um, I have four kids, two of which are in elementary and, and two middle school girls, and all my kids uh, go through the program, uh, so I know it intimately from a parent perspective, <laughs> not just a, a founder CEO perspective. Uh, but things have to be new and fresh and exciting. And if it's not new and different, so every year, let's say take the fun run itself, the soundtrack, the feel, uh, the look, the phrases, then in between the pep rally and the fun run are character lessons that we teach every day. Mm-hmm. So the entire character theme is different every year. So we reskin it to where the DNA is the same and the skeleton of pledge uh, and uh, then fun run stays the same. But uh, the skin of it and the feel of it, the look, the smell, literally we go through the, all the senses and say, how does this feel different every year so it's still exciting and motivating? Okay. Um, that, that definitely makes sense. And one, one other thing that I'm curious about is – so you, you started in uh, Alabama when you were in college. 
for any of the uh, your career post college, was the company in Alabama or were you always in Atlanta? Uh, moved. Uh, first school was spring o two. Got married to my wife that summer. Uh, went to grad school in Kentucky for a few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same school that we serve, Shades Mountain, whose uh, client I called yesterday, called back. Hey, when can you do it again? I scheduled it around my grad school spring break. Then another school called. And then about a year later, we had to decide where are we living? What are we doing? My wife and I, for the first three years, just drove all over the Southeast in our car, friends' couches, brother's basement, you know, whatever it took to, to figure it out. But um, I had very good advice from one person. 49 people said, you need to finish grad school. When you pause educational momentum, you won't go back. And one person said, they're correct, probably, but the most difficult thing to pause and restart is business momentum. You have clients asking for a product, and if you tell them no, wait a few years, they're never gonna, you're never going to get back again. And I followed the one person's advice, not the 49s. I ended up 10 years later going back and finishing my grad school degree and getting my master's, but um, – I think business momentum is one of the most powerful forces. And if you can, if you have it, if you can find it, leverage it, run with it, keep it, maximize it. Well, isn't that sort of what being an entrepreneur is following the path less traveled? Yep. Take it, take taking that risk that everyone else thinks is a little bit crazy. Because if, if it was flipped, right? If all 49 people had given you the device of stop, well then, you know, it I probably would have done the opposite. <laughs> well, potentially that, but also it's that, you know, it, it doesn't take, it doesn't really take a strong person to take that advice. It doesn't take, uh, you know, someone who, uh, is, uh, you know, much more accepting of risk to take that advice and build something. We would all do it if that was the case. That's right. I saw in the client's eyes, their eyebrows went up when the program was over. That's all I needed to know. My gut that it would work came from the eyes of the client. It worked for them. I knew it was mediocre. We had to perfect a lot of things and improve them. I didn't know what I was doing. I never had a business class. But I just knew the client is excited about this product. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the key to business. One of the barriers in technology today, sometimes we don't see the fate. We have lots of data, but sometimes we don't see the emotions of the client. So we, as much as possible from the tech side, we try to get in front of clients or end users and just ask them questions, get to know them as a person, watch the way they use technology or the platform of the program and just try to figure out what draws the emotional connection well and i think what's helpful is you have a um you've got a product that is extremely experiential right it's it's very it's not hard to get that feedback right you can as you said you can see it on their face yep. yeah well and the reason i was asking about location is because i'm curious what being in atlanta has meant for you and your company yeah gosh well i grew up in south florida originally I was a Braves fan uh, my entire life before the Marlins existed. I actually got to sit in an airplane coming back from Philly yesterday morning next to John Smoltz, my like childhood <laughs> hero. He's amazing. Um, so Atlanta, see, it's the capital of the South, and it's it's amazing. I feel like Atlanta combines the best of big city, action-packed, everything's going on, and there's a lot of Southern hospitality that's just very cool. If non-Southerners are listening to this and they think that Southern, whatever misconception they might have about Southerners, come spend a couple of days in Atlanta, come to a Braves game with me, uh, eat at the restaurants, meet the people. I just think it's got this perfect blend of people-centric caring for one another and uh, business momentum and exciting futuristic growth. I think Atlanta's just getting started and Glad the rest of the country knows that we're on the map and this is home and I'm here to stay. I, I, I would agree with all of that. And I think, uh, you know, when, when I talk to friends who are in the Northeast or the Midwest or the West Coast, I think you certainly see a lot more West Coast companies putting an office in Atlanta now. I think people get it a little bit more. Um, but there's definitely still that perception out there that this is, uh, you know, not necessarily a backwater, but just not anywhere close to as exciting. And, couldn't be further from the truth. I, I love having people visit who kind of walk around and they're like, oh, I was like, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, well, if someone wants to learn more about Booster, how can they do that? Yep. Choose booster.com. If, uh, if someone wants to inquire about a program, we'd, we'd come to the school, meet with them in person. We'd, we'd start with questions. Tell me about your school. Why do you want to raise funds? Are we a good fit? We might not be. We just want to learn about them. I think we will be. And then if a team member wants to inquire about working with us, uh, Again, we're in, we're in every state, so choose Booster. We also have a uh, spirit wear division that we spun off. Every school buys spirit wear. So Booster Spirit Wear is now the largest producer of youth T-shirts in the country. We print about 3 wow. million T-shirts right up the road. So spirit wear T-shirts, promotional products, we, we have all that supply schools with that as well.
Fantastic. Parents, educators, listen to this. Choosebooster.com. Chris, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, now we've got Eric Bush, Demand Driven Technologies. How are you doing today, my friend? Great, Joe. How about you? Good. Um, so, Eric, let's start out by talking about the technology. Give people a little bit of an executive summary of how it works. So we provide uh, cloud-based uh, supply chain software for clients that want to improve their inventory and materials management as well as their production scheduling. And it's uh, an area that is dramatically underserved, actually. A lot of uh, investors thought this was an area that had seen a lot of attention. There wasn't any real problems to solve, things like that. And in truth, the logic that the big ERP companies that provide the technology that the major corporations around the world run on, uh, the logic was developed back in the 70s and never really changed, and the world's changed since then. So the big differentiator in what we offer is demand-driven approaches, when the whole idea here is that we're going to pace your materials, your production scheduling, to what's actually happening in the market, not your forecast. Forecasts are inevitably inaccurate, and they've gotten less and less accurate over time, primarily because of product proliferation. One of our big clients is Michelin. They're, they're implementing 70 plants with our software around the world. And if you look at automotive tire sales in the U.S. over the last 30 years or thereabouts, in the late 70s, there were 10 tire sizes in the U.S. that drove 90% of the sales. Now, the top 10 sizes are probably a third of the business, and there's 700 sizes overall available. You just look on the road anymore. You see so many different vehicles with different mm -hmm. tires. It's become a very, very challenging issue for them. And the old logic depends on an accurate forecast. So we're saying, hey, the best... Uh, signal you can get for demand is the actual order the customer gives you instead of your estimate of what they're going to give you. And we pace materials and scheduling of your production against that signal directly. And, you know, when we first met, I was somewhat shocked that something like this doesn't exist because I think most of us who have been in any sort of revenue uh, customer facing position, you understand how the forecast goes, right? Really, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, your superior comes and says, I'd like you to put together, you know, a forecast of sales for the next year. And you go off of, you know, certainly some realistic, uh, you know, indications, right? But a lot of it is, well, I think this deal might close and we're having a good conversation. And, you know, Frankly, it's an arbitrary number. Absolutely. And it's just shocking to me that that is how business is done in the year 2019. Well, in one way, it makes sense. It's the most logical thing to do. You know, Gretzky said, I skate to where I think the puck's going to go. So, you know, why don't we figure out what our customers are going to buy? And they have these resources now in these companies called demand planners, which to me is a bit of an oxymoron. They're going to actually plan what the customers <laughs> are going to buy for them. No, they're going to buy what they're yeah. going to buy, right? And I think the uh, the reality is that it all made so much sense back when software was first introduced into manufacturing. If you know what you need to produce, then we can figure out how many things you got to buy and what you need to build and all that stuff, and it all works out. The problem is, is that forecast, that critical assumption in that software doesn't work. And we've proven that time and time again. So by shifting to a demand-driven principle – Companies are seeing much better order fill rates, meaning they can ship every line of the order on time in full. And as well, they see reductions of inventory because they get away from the bias in the forecast that's out there. If I'm a material planner, whether I say it or not, I'm buying double to stay out of trouble because the consequence of stocking out is so much more severe than carrying too much inventory. In fact, if you go to most CF CFOs, they know what their inventory was last year. They know where it is now. But they don't know really what it should be. Mm -hmm. And so there's this tendency to just overcompensate. And you'll go out into plants and you'll see FedEx boxes that were obviously expedited that have dust on them and are unopened. Why did that happen? Because somebody thought, oh, my God, we got to go do this right away. Then, in fact, we didn't really need it. And that variation in the, in the forecast and the actual way demand comes through becomes a real problem. And that's something that wasn't considered in that logic as well. And, and of course, so right right now in the evolution of your growth, we're very much talking about the manufacturing industry. Do you have any way of calculating what that extra inventory is costing? Absolutely. Every So I share a lot of Chris's you know values in a, in a sense of we built this company to create value for our clients. You know, when I started the company, I looked around. My former job, I was a VP of operations for the consulting business at IBM. And we would see time after time these big ERP software implementations go through the client, 
chew up a ton of resource, spend a ton of money, and then the needle never moved. Recognizing that and knowing that the methodology and the, the solution that we have actually works, the commitment we had was that we have to be everything big software isn't. We have to be rapid time to value. The client knows what they're going to get out of it up front. There's a clear business case. So we actually simulate for each client in advance what the use of our solution will do for them. And they get a very clear understanding of the level of inventory reduction, the improvements in service, and factors such as that. And that really drives a much better relationship from the beginning. We want them you know, to get value from this because if we do that, we'll be very distinct from our competitors and we'll have a good business as a result. So I want to talk more about your background because, um, you know, on this show, we have a lot of first time entrepreneurs, um, in, and, and most of them are maybe right out of college. They might be like Chris where they started in their dorm room. They've been, you know, it's taken off for years. You were at IBM for a lot of your career. Yes. And you are almost an accidental entrepreneur. Um, and so I'm, I, I want, <laughs> well, no, it's, yeah. it, through my IBM career, there were days where I had ideas and I really wanted to go, but <laughs> with the wife and the kids and the bills, never really had the right situation to do that. After I retired, this opportunity kind of fell in my lap where a colleague guy had worked with years before had developed some software, wanted to get out of that business, but Hey, maybe you can do something with it. Kind of a story. And knowing that it created value knowing that the same ideas had worked for us inside IBM. We had used similar concepts uh, in my role there. I thought, what the heck? Let's go see if we can make this go. You know, we went out trying to raise money. The investors that we talked to said, you know, you got a lot of evangelizing to do because this is a sticky market to sell into. You're dealing with the vital organs of a manufacturing company. They're not just going to change this on a whim. It's mm -hmm. not going MySpace to Facebook. You know, it's <laughs> not that kind of a change that you're going to go through. But – by demonstrating to clients that they're getting better value, kind of the word of mouth that Chris was talking about started to work for us. And the ideas got out into the market. It's very much like an open source movement where people are collaborating on these concepts. And that is then creating kind of a blue ocean opportunity for us to pursue. Uh, and that's really kind of the, the legacy of it all. But no, I did not start in my dorm room at Miami University of Ohio back in the <laughs> 70s and plot my way into this thing. <laughs> well, you, you you almost have a, a Godfather-type situation. You tried to get out, and they pulled you back yeah, in. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so, look, you, you talk about the evangelizing. And so, look, clearly, you know, you, you talked about how many plants you're in for Michelin. You guys are having a lot of success with the product. But because this has been done a certain way for so long, I'm curious about – the process to get there, right? Absolutely. And th people will say, well, wait a minute, I can't pace to actual demand because I can't respond fast enough. I have suppliers, and I got lead times, and we got stuff coming from Asia. So how's that going to work? And it's all based on the logic. Our principle is that you're, we're going to hold stock for you of the right materials that will allow you to do this. And if you can get them across that bridge, then the doors open up and the windows open up and they start to see tremendous opportunities for improvement. The way we do that is through those simulations. Mm -hmm. We want we call it a fact-based selling approach. If there's opportunity for you here, you can make a decision. If we can get clients to at least do the simulation, 70-80% of the time we're going to get to a proposal and most of the time we're going to win the business there. Mm -hmm. So, it's all based on delivering value to them. We've done tons of pilots, you know, Michelin started with 5 pilots. Those were successful. That led to the commitment to the 70 plants. Um, and so now that people are seeing that this is really working for them in the manner that they were expecting, um, what we're finding is people coming to us. They're already kind of checked in on the opportunity it represents and, and want to know how to get started. So has the, has using the forecast been, um, I guess I'm just curious how this became so entrenched. Is it that there just wasn't a better way to do it? Right. That's it. it just I mean, there's, there's a concept called lean out there, which is based on true pull. And there's another concept called theory of constraints. So there are ideas out there, but they had never kind of reached the scale of opportunity that this represents because they were missing some pieces. And the people who really created this methodology called demand-driven MRP were the creative ones who fused those two conventions together, the pull concepts of lean and TOC with the conventional planning of MRP. Mm -hmm. And the innovative thoughts that went into that really is what broke through the ice and created the opportunity that we're dealing with. Were, were you mainly, when you were at IBM, I'm assuming that you were heavily working in this world? Um, 
I had a lot of experience with manufacturing and distributors That's, earlier in my career. Yeah. And then in my operations role, my job was to manage the supply chain of the consulting resources we had globally. So think of 3,000 skill families, yep. you know, Java developers, architects, you name it, all sorts of different resources. We were trying initially to follow forecasts on that. Those were inherently wrong. We ended up with a big distortion of our skills around the time of Y2K, right? That We got to that cliff. That ended. That work was gone. Now, all of a sudden, dot-com is exploding. ERP is exploding. We had to make massive shifts in our resource base. So we developed a skills transition program to move resources from one um, skill family to another. We also wanted to break free of the partner's forecast of what their outlooks were going to be because those were always more optimistic than they were. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this in a big consulting firm, guess what? You can't hire. If you can't hire, you can't grow. So by realigning the method here, we got tremendous leverage out of it. And it was really that knowledge and having done that for about 10 years that really helped give me the experience to be effective in the role I'm in now. So you saw this issue in a different facet of business. Yep. And then years later, you were able to turn that into demand-driven technology. Exactly. Okay. Um, I'm curious about how your experience at IBM, I mean, certainly it can be from your actual work, but just at being at a large company, a storied company like IBM, how does that inform the way that you are building uh, and recruiting at demand driven. Yeah, the good question. Um, I, I had a phenomenal career and I was blessed to have that opportunity and I got to do some very interesting and cool things and I learned a lot through that process. Um, I also saw the underbelly and the things that didn't work, right? And that there would be a tendency to major on the minors and, and measurement by objectives can go too far. So I think the idea of how to build a company and how to grow something, I had a lot of experience with that with what we were doing with our global operations. Uh, was very, very beneficial. I think at the same time, there was this reality that we've got to be pragmatic. There's only so much time you have in the day. And even, you know, we've gone from three or four people to now 25 people, and we're going to probably double in size in the next year. That's great that you got all these other resources, but the waves of work to be done continues to come at you and you have to be good at prioritizing and being very selective about what you put your time into. It's not about doing everything. It's about doing the right things. And we pound this on with our leadership team. We talk about it all the time um, because there's always more work to do than you've got resources to deal with. And I think the the benefits of Knowing what a big company, how process should work, how mm -hmm. companies should be organized, how to run a business, had tremendous experience there. At the same time, you know, learned enough to know that you can't just turn it into IBM, right? That's not the goal here. It's to be pragmatic and selective in what we focus on. Well, how are you finding the right people to do that? Because especially right now at the company at such a young stage, you know, those key hires are really important and people's... Uh, skills and personalities can have an oversized effect on the direction of the company. Um, it was, this is very interesting for me. I, in my IBM career, I literally was flying around the world a lot. I spent two and a half years in London, but for the most part, I was working remotely, you know, dealing with staffs all around the world, working out of my home a lot. And I had 40,000 people on my staff, but they were spread out everywhere. I didn't know anything about Atlanta. I've been here now 19 years. I don't know anything about what goes on inside the perimeter, blah, blah, blah. I started trying to raise money and I started meeting people. And it's amazing the connections that I've been able to develop in the city here. Uh, through Mosley Ventures, Sig Mosley, John Vecchio, um, the support that they've provided, the people that they know, another gentleman on our staff uh, or our, our board and an investor, Mike Parham, phenomenal guy who uh, taught an entrepreneurial shop class at Emory, still does. He met some folks some younger guys going through their MBAs thought, Hey, maybe Eric, you ought to take a look at these two of them have hired on with us. So, and then they know people and they know people. And now you start meeting other investors and other people and just getting that local connection. This is the first time I really felt like I'm in Atlanta because of what my experience in my career had been. And as Chris was saying, it's a phenomenal area to live. It gets hot in the summer for a guy from Cleveland, Ohio, but <laughs> uh, I think the word of mouth. We have people looking to get into the company now, which is great, you know, and we've found that we're building a reputation. Um, Melissa, who's our director of marketing, has uh, done a great job of getting us more visible on social media. 
So we're finding that we're becoming more visible in that way, and that that helps a lot in terms of attracting the right kind of talent. We we, we dove deep into the uh, the Atlanta connection when you and I first met, yeah. and uh, I, I love hearing it because I mean, look, I am an evangelist for this city. I grew up here, and frankly, you know, didn't didn't think that I would kind of stay and grow and make a career here. And it, it is a fantastic place to be. And so I really want everyone to know that. And, absolutely, you know, whether you are on, whether you're right out of college or whether you have had, uh, you know, a full career, I think that the openness with which, uh, assuming that you show integrity and competence, the openness with which the business community will embrace you is just it's it's frankly stunning for a relatively uh you know mature city right yeah, absolutely it's um i think part of it has to do with the fact and this is my own little diagnosis here um that there are so many transplants in the city that people are very much used to either making friends with people who they didn't you know know from growing up or you know moving here and making new friends and so it just gives uh people Maybe a little bit more openness to strangers Absolutely. and hearing new things. I had lived in Denver for a couple of years earlier in my life, and it was similar, very transplant-oriented kind of population there and very welcoming and whatnot. I think the embrace that we've gotten from Atlanta, plus you cannot discount in my job the airport. I mean, I can get anywhere in the world, and we have clients all around the world now, like tiny little company. We've got clients on six continents. The functionality that that provides a business like ours is – you know, immeasurable. I mean, it really helps us so much control spending on travel, but having quick access to wherever our clients are. It's like a pitch for the Metro Atlanta <laughs> Chamber right there. Thank you, Bill Hartsfield. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so we, we've, we've focused a lot on what you're currently doing in manufacturing, but when I hear about this technology, it seems to me like there's a lot of other applications. Absolutely. We've already got uh, a good bit of, of our client population is in the wholesale distribution space. But what's really exciting is now we're starting to get into retail. And retail is a whole different animal. There's segments of retail that are a good fit for what we do. There's others like high fashion apparel and things like that that don't necessarily fit into the offerings that we provide. Uh, but we've got some very interesting pilots with some global brands, uh, the names that you would all recognize we can't talk about yet, underway, which are very promising and which we expect we'll be able to announce relationships with those clients in the coming uh, coming months. That's very exciting. So manufacturing, retail, just the beginning. I feel like healthcare, too. Healthcare right? is another great spot. We've done some pilots in uh, managing central supplies for hospitals. Um, they're not... They're not really thinking like supply chain people, so there's a lot of opportunity for improvement there. Mm -hmm. And that can free up physical space in their hospital, which another room for beds or another MRI machine that gives them a lot of room for that. And obviously, if we can help free up some working capital, that'll help them uh, you know, put that money to better use in serving patients. Yeah. Okay. So, so just the beginning, and clearly everyone here is going to be hearing big things about demand-driven in the coming months. Um, if they want to find out more now, how do they do that? Sure. Uh, you can find us at demanddriventech.com. Uh, it's a long name, kind of like international business machines. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, demanddriventech.com. Uh, look for us on social media and LinkedIn, things like that. You'll be able to find us. Okay. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thanks a lot, Joey. All right. Scott Roby, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Joey. Excellent. So, Scott, you are with where to go And for anyone who is uh, looking this up online, it is spelled W-A-R-E, the number two, G O. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, but I assume that that name came from, of course, uh, you know, what people would normally think of how to spell this is where should you go? And how does, does, does that relate to what you guys do at all? Or is it just a nice little coincidence? Maybe more warehouses to go, right? Uh, w A R E okay. warehouse. Ah. Uh, so more of an emphasis on the, uh, on the warehouse and the full fulfillment supply chain side of the house, not just so much as a direction, but it does work together, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities there to exploit that. Well, because of course we are talking about where certain supplies should go. Absolutely. Okay. So let, let's back up a little bit. Um, you, you know, so we, we talked to Eric who, uh, you know, had a long career at IBM. You've had a long career at UPS. That's right. Okay. Another large storage company, um, only a couple of blocks from where we're sitting right now. So talk to me about how we got from UPS to where to go and what the relationship is between both of them. Actually, where to go is a, uh, is a, a subsidiary of UPS. Uh, early last year in 2018, 
Uh, we had been working on some innovation exercises at UPS. We uh, pitched a few concepts to the UPS leadership. Uh, they saw some uh, saw a lot of value in where to go. They funded it. So as of the uh, first quarter of 2018, we started working on the business. By the uh, second quarter, uh, we had an MVP developed. By the third quarter of 2018, we launched. And then from then, it's been a wild ride of uh, growth and expansion and uh, finding customers and providing service. I, I think this is interesting because, um, you know, a lot of people's experience with learning about venture capital is that, you know, you have big firms out in Silicon Valley and certainly elsewhere as well that are going to fund a company. And what we see more and more now is that you have larger organizations that understand that they have capital and they have R&D and they have the power to move a technology pretty quickly. And so you're starting to see this um, more. Is this how, – how long has UPS kind of been putting their might behind, you know, sort of um, internal startups, if you will? Uh, I'd like to say for our 100-plus year history, right? <laughs> so for all of our history, we've, uh, we've been working nonstop to invent new things, to um, adapt to new things in the market. Uh, so we have been growing and expanding and inventing new things for a long time. Uh, for the past, uh, gosh, probably a couple of decades, we've had a, a small venture capital, internal venture capital firm where we've, uh, made investments in different emerging technologies that would have some relevance to the UPS, uh, you know, overall business. And then just in the past uh, couple of years, and of course we've had numerous, I mean, over the, over the course of time, numerous acquisitions, numerous partnerships. So we're always in that, in that, uh, that, you know, area. In the past couple of years, we've uh, made a more concerted effort. Uh, we have uh, part of a, a transform transformation effort to uh, to build new parts of our business to address new areas of the market. So it's uh, been a life, you know, a lifetime of uh, activity at UPS, but maybe a little acceleration in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And what what before where to go? What were you working on internal to UPS? Me personally, correct. Uh, I was uh, mo spent most of my time in recent years while I've been in Atlanta in uh, the UPS corporate strategy group and involved a lot of activities, which in could include some M and A activities, uh, partnerships, and joint ventures, uh, looking at uh, obviously strategic uh, initiatives or even a strategic strategic outlook. So a lot of um, a lot of looking outward from UPS and looking for areas in which UPS can expand, develop new areas, become more valuable to our customers. And so, of course, this new venture with where to go is a logical outgrowth of your work in the corporate development group, looking for new technologies and new ways to help. I think so. I would say it's much larger than me, of course, uh, but I'm happy to have a small part in it. So um, let, let's, let's drill down into the technology of where to go. You mentioned warehouses. Okay, so talk to us about the different parties that the software serves. All right, let's uh, let's back up one step and talk about where to go first to make sure we level set on what it is. Right. Sure. So we we offer um, we offer flexible logistics, right? Maybe more specifically, we offer offer fulfillment services as a network. You know, some people call that on demand warehousing. So if you're a business and you want to um, improve your order to delivery speed, or you want to save money, or you simply want uh, you know trusted, high-quality services, you know, where it goes for you. We operate a nationwide fulfillment network uh, with uh, warehouses around the country where um, you know, the network is able to scale up, scale down. It's very adaptable. If you're a business who uh, wants to outsource inventory, wants to uh, supplement your current fulfillment services, you want the flexibility to scale up or scale, scale down very quickly, uh, where to go is for you. We don't have long-term contracts. Or we don't have long-term commitments. We require no capital up front. Uh, so it's a pay-as-you-go model that makes it very easy for uh, customers, companies to drop in, drop out. makes it easy to adapt or align to business demand, which is much like Eric referred to earlier. The technology is uh, it's a cloud-based uh, cloud platform that a uh, merchant can you know can access we use the platform to exchange order information to provide visibility on the status of every item that a merchant gives us whether it's just received at our warehouse whether it's in a, a pick and pack status whether it's being shipped or already delivered uh, they see full visibility through the platform the uh, platform also connects the warehouses so the warehouses have the same visibility and management of uh, of all the items, and as a kind of a, an ecosystem, it's all is self contained, self contained platform where the entire fulfillment experience can be managed uh, from one spot. Okay, so you've got a merchant on one side of the equation, a warehouse on the other. Correct. Okay, and so 
if a what what issues would a merchant be having that they would want to start working with where to go oh any number of reasons it uh, they number one say you're a a small business small to medium business and you're not a logistics expert okay you're an expert in your own business and you're either making something, selling something, but logistics uh, could be a little complicated. Uh, if you want some help with that, you maybe want to outsource it to someone else who can do it. Maybe outsource outsource it to someone who has uh, not just the expertise, but maybe the scale and the efficiency that you as a small business don't have. You can uh, access where to go. You can ta- you can uh, both save money and save time. Maybe you're a medium or larger business. Uh, you have a uh, you have a, your own warehouse in one location, but Maybe you're running out of space, or maybe you just want some supplemental capacity. Maybe it takes uh, too long for your goods to get all the way across the country. You can access where to go, and we can be your supplemental uh, supplemental fulfillment capacity. Or for seasonal items, maybe you have uh, your business ramps up and ramps down, and you need some uh, support that you don't want to just make a large long term contract to uh, you know to handle your peak. You want to be able to scale up and down quickly. Where to go would fit right into that equation. Okay, so in in that example, let's say that I am an Atlanta-based merchant. I have a warehouse here south of the city. I'm starting to do more business in the Midwest, but you know, not to the point where I want to go and either buy or lease a whole big warehouse myself. I can use where to go um, to essentially take advantage of excess space in other warehouses that are already leased or owned by another party. Absolutely. And so from the warehouse side of the equation, how does a warehouse get on your radar um, in order to be part of the Where to Go network? Uh, they can find us. We have, you know, we have some recruiting efforts to, uh, to present our value proposition to warehouses, which is we are able to aggregate demand and bring demand to warehouses that would not normally have access to that. Typically, it's, you know, we'll collect maybe, uh, say, for example, uh, businesses on the East Coast who are looking for West Coast fulfillment capacity. Well, warehouses on the West Coast or 3PLs probably don't have a sales force to target clients on the East Coast, but where to go can aggregate some of that demand and bring business to a warehouse where they can, you know, fill either unused or temporary unused, or in some cases we've had, uh, as we increase in size, we've had warehouses who have proposed building a new facility <clears throat> and using where to go as the launch customer because we can quickly bring demand to them uh, without them requiring a, a sales force of their own or a large marketing uh, expense. I mean, from the warehouse perspective, this sounds very similar to an Airbnb type of concept where you're taking advantage of unused space and making money off of it. It's, it's, uh, it's, there's some similarities there. Certainly from the warehouse, it's great because someone else is, in fact, we become a sales outlet for mm-hmm. a warehouse. Uh, we're bringing the demand to the warehouse. What could be better as a warehouse than someone saying, hey, can I please offer you money to use your space uh, and you don't have to do any work for it? That's, that's found, that's found money bad. for them. It's not bad for the yeah. warehouse. Um, this organization is growing very quickly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sometimes uh, sometimes it makes my head spin. <laughs> so I, I think in uh, – I don't rem- know the, remember the exact time frame. Certainly I think within the past 18, 24 months, it sounds like you're up to, what, 80 to 100 people? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, we uh, – once again, the I mentioned the time frame time, – uh, sort of the timeline at the beginning. Uh, we went from an idea in the first quarter of last year to an MVP in the second quarter to launch in the third quarter and to expansion. So it's been a, a nonstop expansion. We started out, uh, we built some of this on the West Coast. We, as soon as we got our feet settled, we promptly moved into Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta Tech Village, we started at. <laughs> we quickly outgrew Atlanta Tech Village and moved next door in Buckhead. Um, but it's, uh, and we've been adding people uh, ever since. Why is this taken off so quickly? Uh, the value prop, I believe. I think it's, uh, it's, hopefully it comes through in my comments, but it's incredibly attractive to merchants. It's a very flexible, variable, I said pay as you go model. It allows merchants to first very easy to access. So it's easy to use, uh, allows them to ramp up, ramp down with their business. So they're properly aligned with the demand uh, or the seasonality, the demand of their business. Um, and then the, the expertise we provide, there are, uh, I know Eric would know this, uh, many, many businesses who they just are not experts in logistics and they don't want to be. I mean, they're running their business. Logistics is a necessary evil in some ways. Uh, but the market is very competitive, right? The, the people need, people want items very fast. They want, you know, the right item at the right time. Uh, where to go? We make that very easy for you. We, we, we take care of the hard work for the clients, both with perfect service, with good rates, 
We, in some ways, from smaller customers, we give them a, a virtual footprint that gives them the, the, you know, the look and feel of a much larger, much larger company. You know, some people will call it, you know, punching above your weight, uh, for SMBs. So where to go, uh, you know, brings all that. If you can, if you're a business and you can save time, save money, and have more flexibility, there's, it's a, it's a surefire hit. What, um, I mean, look, you've, you've staffed up very quickly. Um, you know, you're, you're spearheading the growth, obviously, with a great team behind you. Um, what, what has been most crucial in terms of building this culture so quickly? Uh, wow. The, uh, well, just, I should point out that just, it is quick, it is crucial to build the culture quickly. And start with that statement that, yeah, if, uh, as, if you don't have a solid culture, I think as a, as a new or young business, uh, things can get off track in a hurry. Uh, Chris talked about it. Eric alluded to it. The um, the the most you want to establish a culture, uh, whether it's work hard, whether it's care about people, whether it's have uh, you know very, very high integrity, or provide, of course, perfect service to all your merchants. You have to instill that uh, every day. You have to walk the walk, as they call it. Uh, for us, it's uh, spending a lot of time together. You know, there's a lot of people who've been added uh, and thrown together in close quarters very quickly. It's spend a lot of time together. It's uh, make a specific effort to talk to people, to have events, have team events, uh, to let people know that you know you're you, you you're paying attention to what they're doing. You're impressed with their work. Uh, you're recognizing the contributions they're making. And again, uh, Chris had sort of mentioned early on, it's just making sure they know you care. Uh, that's a pretty good starting point. Uh, for getting people to buy into to what you want to achieve, because everyone is, let's face it, it's a lot of pressure, uh, it's a lot of effort, a lot of long hours, and if people don't uh, don't don't believe that you support them, it makes it makes it much harder a much harder uh, road to hoe. We um, we actually had someone on yesterday um, with a company called Vestigo uh, that puts together team building events, um, you know, anywhere from a startup to a you know big Fortune five hundred. Um, but very, I mean, extreme events, things like base jumping and, you know, things like that to kind of get the team all, uh, um, you know, on the same page and experiencing adversity together. And so I'm curious, uh, you know, what, what sort of team events at, at where to go? Maybe not base jumping, but, um, we haven't gone that extreme yet. But I think, you know, again, we're, we, we're small, so we'll start small and move up. Yeah. You know, we, we try to do, and these may be, you know, I mean, they may be incredibly common for some companies. Uh, a lot of companies uh, don't do much. Just, it could be simple as we, you know, we, we have, have lunches. We have, uh, team happy hours, right? Do we, uh, we recognize the progress we're making, recognize all the people for the effort it takes to make progress. It's certainly, uh, uh, the, you know, 99% of the progress we make is not because of me or not because of, uh, you know, our senior staff. It's because of all the people doing all the, mm-hmm. you know, all the day to day work. Uh, so we'll have that, um, make sure we, uh, we call out, uh, when folks are doing a good job. So it's, it's, uh, nothing extreme on our end yet, but those are some good ideas. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure how many people I could, uh, get to a volunteer for base jumping, but that might be a good survey question on our next, uh, our next monthly newsletter. Well, they they are shameless plug. That they are headquartered right next door in Atlanta Tech Village. So if you ever want to learn more about space jumping, go next door and check out Vestigo. Um, but so I mean, but here's the thing. So so yes, okay, going out to drinks or lunch might not be anything revolutionary, but I think especially at a company your stage that is bringing on so many new people so quickly that you can probably walk around the office and not recognize you know a number of people who just passed you by. Those little things to get people out of the office and to know um, their colleagues on a human level, partaking in human activities outside, uh, you know, the, the rigors of work. That's really important. You know, sometimes it's simple things like that that do the most. Uh, the human part, you're right. That's the most important category. We're all, you know, all people, everyone that work at Where to Go, uh, the families, friends. I mean, we're, we're real people at work and outside of work. What happens occasionally if you're not careful is you get so busy working on your own work, and maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's an operations person who's focused entirely on operations. Well, you have someone next door who's focused on uh, maybe on some of the technology development versus a salesperson somewhere else. It's easy to find yourself um, in your own silo uh, and making sure that we create opportunities and the uh, the atmosphere for everyone to get to know each other a little bit better and recognize that that's not just that person in that department who's uh you know creating challenges for me or who asks too many questions we're all to ensure that everyone is rowing in the same direction to make sure that we uh, all understand that 
each other's challenges, mm-hmm. each other's capabilities, uh, and that we're all again we're all humans working for the same goal. It's uh that's it. You mentioned crucial. That's the right word. It's critical to establish that early on, um, and keep in it'll make everything better. What, what has your background at UPS, obviously a, a storied Atlanta-based company, meant for the way that you approach um, your team and the technology at uh, where to go? Well, I think, um, like I mentioned earlier, UPS has a 100-year history of inventing things and adapting to things and figuring things out. So in some ways, I would say my, my entire career uh, has been, you know, I've been groomed to something like this, where, we, you know, at UPS, we don't, uh, we don't have, you know, we don't, uh, launch new startups every single day. Mm-hmm. So there's uh, not a lot of uh, not a lot of precedent, not a lot of uh, training wheels, so to speak. But the um, but again, just being in business for a number of years, working with lots and lots of incredibly talented and very uh, high integrity people at UPS, uh, also very very caring organization. You recognize very quickly what good looks like, right? Good people uh, all working toward the same goal with a lot of effort. Uh, it sort of an, becomes a natural extension that that's the type of people we want to work with or where to go. So when we hire people, we hire people with those same kind of qualities. People who, uh, who have not just competence in their field, but they have a desire and they have some passion for what they're working on. And then the, the fit becomes easier at that point. Okay. So, so let's say that we do this again in 12 to 18 months. Um, what is different about where to go then as opposed to where we're sitting here right now? Uh, I think we'll be several orders of magnitude larger, for example. I think we'll have uh, many more capabilities. I would like to think we still have a, uh, a very similar culture. It'd just be, a, uh, just be more people. Um, we uh, feel really good about our sort of our business direction. I uh, am not uh, naive to think that uh, we won't, you know, massage our direction or, you know, pivot a little bit here or there. Uh, I would like to think that uh, at this point, though, we have a good team, we have a good product development roadmap, we have a good strategy, we have good support behind us with uh, with UPS when we need them, and it should be more of the same in a, in a positive way. I love it. Okay, so if you are a merchant that needs some help with your logistics or a warehouse with some extra ex- excess space to give – how would you learn more about where to go? Uh, we're available in all the usual places. You can search out where to go, LinkedIn. We have a, a ver- we have a very extensive website. That's on uh, you know Twitter. All the usual places. Easy to find um, and easy to use if uh, you're a merchant and you want to sign up. And again, that is spelled W A R E. The number two. Go. G-O. Perfect. Scott, thanks a lot. Thank you. Gentlemen, everyone has been great. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for listening to Tech Talk. Thanks, Appreciate Joey. It, Joey. Thanks for the opportunity.